So let's go on to nonverbal communication or nonverbal language. So we have sign language. And this is hand movements to convey messages. Again, this is a complete system. It's as complete as verbal language, so it's not a lesser form of communication. It's got syntax just like uh, the verbal languages. It doesn't have, of course, the, uh, the phonemes because it doesn't have the sounds. There's a lot of variety of sign language across the globe. So there's American Sign Language, there's English Sign Language, or British Sign Language, there's Australian Sign Language. So again, it's like learning a foreign language. And it's not just used by people with hearing problems. So Australian Aborigines use sign language in situations where it's forbidden to speak, so when a widow is in mourning. Um, they also use sign language when it would be a hindrance to speak, like when it, they're hunting. So again, sign language can be used by lots of different people. Another form of nonverbal communication is silence. And it kind of seems ironic, but silence can actually communicate quite a bit. Uh, for instance, social status. In rural Siberia, daughters-in-law have the lowest status in a family, and they rarely speak. Um, think about this in terms of the United States. Think of a courtroom. A judge speaks less than lawyers when they're in the courtroom, but they actually have more power. So we can actually see some social status there. And I threw this picture in here because we can actually, doesn't look like anybody's talking here, and they're conveying quite a bit just in that silence. Um, First Nation peoples, a lot of the various tribes use silence as a part of their communication system. And if you think about this, if they're using silence as a form of communication, when people of the dominant culture started moving westward in the 1800s, it really caused a lot of miscommunication. And in fact, it still causes a lot of miscommunication miscommunication today. So many First Nation students are quiet in the classroom and, of course, in the public school system or the mainstream school system, students are really kind of taught to speak up, speak your mind, and so forth. But in a lot of uh, native groups, it's rude to kind of show your intelligence like that because it's a, a form of putting other people down. So again, it can cause a lot of uh, miscommunications between cultures because we don't necessarily understand each other's communication system. Um, the last part of nonverbal language that I want to talk about is kinesics, and this is body language. Um, this could be hand gestures, it could be facial expressions, it could actually actually be something here like scarification, which we see down here in the right hand side. Um, it's the way we hold our body. So all of those things convey stuff to people that we're trying to communicate with. So if you think about a professor standing in the front of the classroom lecturing and they've got their hands folded across their chest and they're standing there just talking, that conveys something to us. And sometimes these kinesics can be actually more communicative than even the verbal language. And oftentimes those two things contradict one another. So we learn all of these things through the process of our culture. How do we project ourselves with our body language. One of the interesting things with kinesics is this thing called proxemics, which talks about our personal space, our personal bubble. And we don't like people to get into our personal bubble. That's defined culturally. How big is the bubble? Cultures decide that. So people in the U.S. have one of the biggest bubbles, and we don't like people to get in them. So think about going to a movie theater if there are other people sitting in there, do you immediately go and sit next to them? No, you go find a seat where there's hardly anybody. We only sit next to somebody else when we absolutely have to. Same thing on the bus. And this is actually one of the things that a lot of people from the United States have trouble getting used to when they travel overseas is because other cultures don't have that personal bubble or it's very, 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 very tiny. <coughs> so anyways, those are some of the nonverbal forms of communication. Now, language can, um, can tell us a lot about cultures. There are a couple of kind of theoretical approaches to studying language, and one is the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, which you should have read about. And this simply states that language predetermines our thinking, and so it's linguistic determinism. So language determines our consciousness of the world and behavior. So if a language has no word for what in English we have snow, then a person that speaks that language can't think of snow like we do here in the United States. 
But also, if we think about people in the United States as opposed to somebody living in an Arctic environment like the Inuit or the Sami or Eskimo, then they have a lot of words for snow. So that allows them to think about snow in a way here in the United States we don't. So we might think about put a qualifier on it and have dirty snow or yellow snow because the dog's been there or something. But anyways, this whole superior warfare hypothesis is all about how language determines how we view the world. So look out a window in your house. Um, if you only had the colors red, blue, yellow, black, white, and brown to describe the scene, does that change how you see the view? And there are some cultures. Cultures have different terms for colors. It's not that they don't see the colors, but they group them differently. Um, but look at that scene again, and what if you only had three colors, like red, black, and white? So in the Sapir Whorf hypothesis, Edward Sapir here on the left and Benjamin Whorf on the right say that yes, this would, if you only had those colors, it's going to change how you see the world outside your window. Now another kind of approach to the study of language is called sociolinguistics. And this is simply the study of language in social context. So it's an idea that poses that cultural and social context determines content and form of language. Now most linguists kind of follow this sociolinguistic approach, but also recognize that culture doesn't just shape language. Language does shape culture. So these kind of go together. Some of the things that we've learned about in the study of language is pretty interesting. And we've picked up on this thing called euphemisms. And euphemisms is simply doublespeak. Um, so people find euphemisms to talk about subjects that make them uncomfortable. So we can learn a lot about norms and values without anybody explicitly telling us just by listening for euphemisms and so forth. So if you think about sex in the United States, Anything to do with sex, we have tons of euphemisms for, whether it's pregnancy, whether it's copulation, or sexual organs. In fact, there's a website online, and it has over a 1,000 euphemisms for the word penis and over 500 for vagina. So obviously, this is a society that has a few hang-ups in talking about anything to do with sex. So it can be pretty interesting. Language can also tell us how groups classify their worlds, um, it gives us a kinship terminology. Again, it can tell us about colors. It can indicate cultural identity. So if you think about Ebonics, or even, I like to talk about Anthrospeak, if you think about your first assignment, disciplines in academia have their own set of language, and that identifies us as anthropologist. And there are different dialects, too. So these are all kind of ways to express a cultural identity. Um, just to kind of wrap it up here, Language is always changing. So if you think about English, and if you see the United States here in that bright green, and you can actually see all of the other languages that are related to ours. So we actually are related to other Indo-European languages, which started in Western Asia. So we're in the same linguistic family as Iranian, Greece, Greek, excuse me, Slavic, Celtic, and Germanic languages. What's kind of interesting is language is one of the first things to change when groups come into contact with one another. And what I want you to do right now, and I will leave you with, is to think about why that may be.